YouTube. Hello, YouTubers. I just launched the recording for YouTube. So as I was saying, I've got two fantastic guests today. Uh, first, uh, Jamie, would you care to introduce yourself for people who might not be aware of all many game jams you've been participating and so on? I'm I'm a I'm a veteran who's semi-retired from Game Jam. So, uh, hi, my name is Jamie, uh, and my pronouns are they, he, and I really love to make games. And yeah, I'm really, really, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, and uh, it's a quid pro quo. I had uh, Francis uh, Lowell Francis on then i was invited to the gauntlet where you were and now you're here so it's actually it's it's a big ponzi scheme uh, uh we we're not doing it <laughs> out of friendship but out of pure vino interest uh speaking of money and people who can manage a business in the profitable ttrpg industry jason could you introduce yourself uh yeah so uh i'm jason Petr. He, him, uh, of Genesis of Legend Publishing Incorporated now. Yeah, As I was you. saying, big business here, Incorporated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm a megacorp. Megacorp of one um, that doesn't pay himself salary. So, you know, I'm a good me megacorp. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been working on a game or two. Um, most recently, I just sent off Sig City of Blades to the printers. Um, I should be getting feedback shortly from uh, the pre-press folks. Uh, I released Palanquin recently. I'm working on a bunch of other games in the hopper. And right now, I'm helping uh, Stuart, uh, or let's say Shepard, um, uh, once more into the void, into existence. Shepard, I saw what you did there. Amazing. <laughs> this is my favorite Kickstarter in the Citadel. Oh. Wow. <laughs> A lot of references to a video game I never played, but I still can work out that uh, there are uh, references. Uh, but uh, I'm sure... I'm sure the design of your game will have a massive effect on whoever uh, purchases it. So <laughs> excitedly, this will so be an excellent game. Very briefly, before <laughs> we barely jump... contained enthusiasm. Anyway, sorry, go yeah, ahead. No, no, go. <laughs> uh, very briefly, before we jump into that, uh, one of our traditional questions of this uh, sideshow born out of the Panini situation, uh, people should go check Yes Indeed to find out what Panini wins, means, uh, Jemmy, what is your, your routine like uh, at the moment? Ooh, yeah. So lately, uh, so I do have some health stuff that I do my best to manage. So uh, I wake up in the morning and see how many spoons I have available, like what kind of day is it going to be, hopefully. But uh, mostly my regular day is uh, I admittedly just focus a lot on TTRPGs. I either get to have a game in the morning, either playtest or I'm helping someone else playtest. Uh, if I don't have a game, I work on um, a lot of the different projects I have going on. Someone recently asked me how many projects I have. And I realized it's like around 12 that I'm actively uh, working Ooh, on. Wow. And, I, and I was telling myself, I'm slowing down uh, lately. I, ugh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so uh, that means I'm either doing layout or I'm playtesting or I'm writing or I'm designing. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I do this full time. And in between, I make sure to pet a cat or uh, sometimes I get on like hour long calls with people to talk about design and that much of a a geek so i try to not do game stuff sometimes i try to watch anime or uh play video games uh like mass effect or dragon age <laughs> uh yeah speaking with people about game design jason you also failed to mention the very excellent game design launch which which i got so much support from uh, on my own project Right. Uh, yeah. So I run the Game Design Lounge, which is a weekly hour long call um, in rotating time slots so that there's always one continent that really shouldn't be attending. 
Um, so, uh, for instance, last uh, Sunday, uh, which was yesterday, uh, was a uh, North America and Europe. And I told one of my Australian friends, no, please don't show up. Please go to bed. It's like four in the morning. No, no sleep. Um, but uh, yeah, we, so we had a great conversation about uh, game design and publishing and uh, what formats you print things in and what quantities and where to get quotes and all that good publishing stuff. Uh, in addition to running the RPG design panel cast on the side, um, which is like 280 episodes in. Yeah, so... and the latest episode featured me <laughs> and Pam Punzalan, Diogo Noguera, and Alan Cushidio. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name uh, well, uh, which was the, the panel we recorded uh, a while ago at Metatopia, but uh, all people like us who use English are their second language to engage with the, the TTRPG uh, community. So yeah, go check uh, RPG D panel cast. I recommend it. So, and I, I briefly mentioned, I highly recommend to go check uh, the interview with Jamie on Yes Indeed podcast uh, by Mark Shepard, uh, which, uh, which is quite cool uh, as well. But let's jump into uh, the, what is it called? The subject of the matter today, Once More Into the Void. So Once More Into the Void, it's not a sequel, right? It's not a sequel to Into the Void. It's the title of the game. Could you explain a bit that title? Sure, sure. So the game is meant to immediately evoke this sense that when you play the game, this is, uh, that there is like, a prequel or like this, this game is a sequel, right? Like it's supposed to build in a lot of history uh, into the relationships, into the game when you play. So as you play, uh, the players, the, the characters build that history in, in the background as it needs to come up in the fiction, in the story, in the scenes uh, as people like. So that's, that's, a, that's a cool aspect of the game because a lot of these stories it's uh you meet in the tavern and so now now you know each other for the first time but this is a game where it's understood that you have a long history together and it's up to you to decide how to define it so that that does that is what once more into the void uh brings about but also it's meant to bring to mind the idea of once more into the breach like that that classic uh line yeah <laughs> so and that's a game designed by Jamie, but somehow, Jason, you got involved at some point. Uh, how did that happen? Um, I have been um, checking out and backing a whole bunch of different uh, bundles and itch things. And I uh, was going through uh, one of the bundles and start and uh, I was struck by the cover and went, wait a second, this premise sounds interesting and devoured uh, once more into the void. Uh, I was blown away. And knowing that um, Kickstarter is not accessible for people in certain countries, uh, I got in touch with Jamie and asked if they'd be interested in um, my assistance to help make this possible. Uh, fortunately, I don't know why, but they said yes. So uh, we've been able to uh, secretly work away in the back end um, to help make this thing happen. And we're extremely excited. We got some beautiful art um, and the layout's looking fine. Uh, the the mock-ups are stunning and um, I'm really excited. So. I'm guessing that your budget on making Once More Into the Void for Itch was approximately zero dollars. Oh yeah, like all my games, uh, exactly. I spent many hours going through pixabay.com, approximately six to eight hours just to find decent <laughs> images. <laughs> so I was like, wait a second, if Jamie can pull this off with nothing, I wonder what they can pull off with a few thousand dollars worth of dev costs and art budget. So. Uh, 
I got a slideshow running right now with the art, and I know some, uh, and I added even some uh, from the, the Kickstarter page. But some of the picture you sent me said new cover. Uh, does that mean that it's gonna be and and the art uh, in the slideshow has got rather different styles? So what is gonna be the style of the game? Is it like that new cover, which is sort of, I guess, Iron Swan ish? I mean, more photograph which are uh uh photoshopped to to make oh. more appealing or is it more cartoonish like the rest of the art or is it a mix yeah yeah so the so the iron swornish the 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 photo manipulation with the, the photograph that's actually the original cover so oh, that one I is the original there. okay yeah, yeah. I put it out there because uh, so some people know that I released Once More Into the Void uh, last year. And so it's actually been out for a while. And I'm really, I'm really lucky that people have played it at a few cons before the Panini happened. Uh, <laughs> they played it at a few cons or they played it online. Some people have made hacks for it, like they've done a version with Doctor Who, uh, which is really cool. Uh, some people have done a superhero hack, which is really fun. Uh, so it's been, it's been around for a while. So I wanted to put the original cover for people to know that this is, uh, this is a new version of the game where, because being able to like talk to artists and tell them what I'd like to see in, in illustrations is a completely new experience. I've never collaborated with an artist before. So it was such a shocking experience to just be able to say, like I, I had all these Pinterest boards and I was like, I want this character to be the child of Tally and Legion from Mass Effect, but also put in your own original character into it who I really like and they were formed. I was like, wow, it's amazing. It's like magic <laughs> excellent um so i heard that the game i heard a few things regarding the the system uh i heard the word firebrand being thrown away and i've heard it quite a few times but i'm not entirely sure what firebrand means and i also heard that the game is made out of several different air quote mini games so, so what's the game about how do you play what's the system like and, uh, and I can go have a nap while you explain that for an hour. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so Jason, if I could ask you to describe the premise, that would be really cool. And then I'll jump in with the system. Certainly. So Teamwork, the basic premise right? is um, you, were a, you were a family, you were a crew, and you saved the universe together. You were uh, big heroes. Uh, thing is your last job went real bad and uh the captain didn't live up to their expectations and the expectations of their people so the family fell apart everyone went their separate ways but now the galaxy is in danger once more so the captain's trying to bring back this disillusioned and wounded crew back together for one last job, um, including such characters as the really uh, bitter and broken uh, member of the crew, the uh, idol, uh, the um, starry-eyed dreamer who is totally believing in what's happening now and, and is totally enthusiastic and naive, um, the uh, enemy who's reformed uh, and tried to get back into things, um, the captain, and there's a bunch of other ones, uh, other amazing character types. But uh, so you're a crew that's trying to overcome your past and your uh, the issues that you have with each other for the greater good. Um, and uh, it's a set of mini games where you're going through the process of reconciliation, fallout, vindication, exploration, uh, finishing off with the great mission once more into the void. Jamie. Yeah, that was perfect. I love asking other people to talk about my games because it helps me learn more <laughs> about the game too. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what the premise is. And so 
uh, one of the players will play as the captain and everyone else will choose which playbooks they'd like to pick up. And these are very simple playbooks. Uh, they're not like what we think of in terms of PPTA. You only have to pick out uh, a few parts of uh, your aspects. Uh, you only have to, um, it's, it's, it's from a very simple pick list. You have to choose two qualities for yourself and someone else chooses a third quality. And then you have to choose two aspects for your look and someone else chooses the third aspect. And that's all you need for a character. That's all you need to start with. And the firebrand system was first, so we call it the firebrand system, but like, it's not its official name. It's just based on what Megway and Vincent Baker created when they created mobile frame zero. I almost always say mobile, uh, mobile frame zero firebrands. Firebrands, there you go. Uh, because mobile frame zero was the yeah, original-ish yeah. Lego mech game. Exactly, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And then the Firebrands built, created, I think they sort of fra uh, officially called it the Firebrands framework. Oh, they did? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I've heard Firebrands framework as the mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's super shiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really awesome structure because it was first created and I got to play Firebrands a few times. It was created to be a game that you can like pick up at a party uh, where you can pick up like you don't need any prep, you don't need a jam, you don't need to have a plot in mind, you just need to have the game in your hand. And so once you make your characters, you just decide which mini games to play. So usually with these Firebrand games, there's a first game that's recommended that everyone plays and there's a last game that's recommended. So there, there's some games that, that break the mold, but in general, that's how it is. So in this case with Once More Into the Void, you start with the recruitment montage as you get the crew together and you quickly establish some parts of your past together and who the characters are. And then uh, it ends with Once More Into the Void, which is the final mission, which you may or may not survive. It's really uh, because throughout the mini games, there's a mechanic that I added that is the same all throughout, no matter which game you play, which is the loyalty draw. So you draw a card from the deck and you see how much loyalty you've earned. And it's up to a character to decide how to how to split the tokens depending on the mini game. Usually it's a captain who, who splits it, but it depends. And you use those loyalty tokens in the end to try to get through the final mission. And it's, it's always like nail biting. It's always like really thrilling to see if you're gonna make it in the end uh, with that final mission, because there's a very real possibility that you won't survive. So there are, there are options for what happens to your character if you, if you perish or if you disappear mysteriously. So uh, Once More Into the Void is best played across two sessions, I feel, but we're working on options for a one shot and also like how to play it across four sessions, if you like. So it's super, super fun. Uh, and mostly the mini games are focused on setting up a scene or, or a series of scenes. And then you choose from these different role-playing prompts. Usually I attach really like sharp questions. So for example, just to, just to pull one, let's say you do, let's say you do the, the recruitment montage. That's like one of my favorite. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I said recruitment montage. I meant the training montage. That's like one of my favorite ones. One shot to get it right. And so you have to try your best uh, to, to team up. I've seen some people take this game and apply it to their superhero games, which I really like to see. That's super fun. So basically you choose a challenge and it could be things like, I modify my weapons and you have a good idea of how I can push my equipment. Do you patiently teach me how to or take over brusquely and why? Or you could choose another option like, um, let's see. Ooh, as we fight, I accidentally reveal that I know more about the enemy than I should. Do you confront me and demand answers or pretend nothing happened? So there are all these like sharp prompts to like guide role play and guide what happens between the characters. And yeah, so basically there are nine mini games to choose from. Uh, and that's, that's how the firebrand system generally works. Cool. We got in the chat room games from the Wildwood who ask if there will be new play Ooh, hi, Luke. new playbooks as part of the Kickstarter. Ooh, Jason, what do we say? <laughs> oh, sorry, you muted Jason. 
it depends on how our funding goes. <laughs> if you pay uh, for them, so you'll have some. <laughs> if you want to encourage new playbooks and new mini games, you better go ahead and head over to uh, Kickstarter.games, which will take you right to the uh, to, to the page to be notified when we launch uh, at approximately this time tomorrow. Yay, I bypassed time zones that way. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Approximately awesome. this time perfect. tomorrow. It's a pity that most of the people who see this will see it on YouTube or in audio, so they won't have any time reference because you did not give them a date. <laughs> uh, so on May 11th, 2021. All good. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Let, let's give the year because YouTube. Uh, so uh, yeah, so head on over to Kickstarter.games. Um, we have a whole bunch of very exciting pledge levels, including uh, my personal favorite, and I think it's Jamie's favorite as well. Yeah, for sure. We have a one dollar Canadian uh, community copy level uh, for PDF. So anyone can back the campaign for $1 to get a uh, complete PDF of the game. Awesome. Uh, meant to support folks who are in financial hardship because we're in a pandemic and have been for a year. Panini, Panini. Point. We don't use Panini, it. yes. It, it's a $1 Panini. Uh, so, um, yeah, so... Uh, any we can get as many people um, as possible to play this game to enjoy themselves and for those who have the means uh, we have higher levels um, we have a level that lets us um, lets people sponsor uh, physical uh, community copies that are greatly discounted for those in financial hardship uh, and uh, for people who have the means um, the PDF is going to be affordable. The print book will be reasonably priced considering it's a full color hardcover book. Um, and I, I like to, don't like to toot my own horn, but I think I can do decent production values sometimes. I I've heard um, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, this is going to be a gorgeous book. Um, like, I don't think we'll quite reach the point of Bluebeard's Bride. But I don't think any one can reach the point of Bluebeard's yeah, Bride. Yeah, I was going to say that. Bluebeard's um, Bride is, like, on this top shelf, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, so, and we're also going square format because we wanted to let the text breathe. And it, it felt like it was the correct size for almost this art book style of um, game. So that, that's the book you try to put in your bookshelf with the other games and it's just not matching the format and it's... <laughs> so you need to put it horizontally somewhere else. Yeah, uh, yeah, it will work. I mean, well, the thing is it will fit nicely beside all of the indie books. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, so um, we're super excited about this. This is going to be beautiful. Um, yeah, we're we need working to get with some amazing artists. Yeah, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because the more backers, also the more art. So, uh, what I often ask uh, people doing Kickstarters: Do the campaign includes trying to pay cover the advance costs for for printing books and putting them on the shelves of brick and mortar shops? Uh, yes. Well. So we get to afford an actual offset print run if we hit, I believe, our first stretch goal. Okay. Um, if we only hit our base goal, it, it's a little iffy, and yeah. it may not make it onto retail shelves. Um, but we're really hoping that we move past that because there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm in the online about this. Uh, mostly because Jamie's awesome. Uh, so because of that, we're hoping to uh, go to an offset print run and uh, this will be available in distribution um, 
at the very least through Indie Press Revolution, and uh, it will likely also be through some traditional distribution uh, if we can pull this off. Awesome. Uh, Jimmy, uh, what was your approach to the, the Kickstarter? Is it your first? Did you have goals in mind? Or, or did you just delegate everything to Jason? Uh, I really feel like Jason was my superhero <laughs> because uh, <laughs> uh, I had, I really have to stress that I never, uh, it's really impossible to think about getting to Kickstarter from my position. So I never even really thought about it. And I've never had experience in like printing a book because we don't have access here locally in the Philippines to cheaper printers or there's some uh, that I'm aware of, but like it takes a lot of finagling and something like color, something like hardcover that's really difficult. And so Jason was very, very generous with his expertise and his experience and really helping us figure out like what dimensions we're looking at and uh, yeah, he like he like took care of. We we're a very good team, I think. He took yeah, care of no, this this worked with real the Kickstarter. Well. <laughs> like we're having fun, like just going like, okay, I'm gonna work on this, and then you work on this, and then it just keeps going back and forth. Uh, so so I really want to stress that Jason has been handling uh, everything related to the Kickstarter, and I'm super 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 grateful. I just get to focus on just working on the game, which is like a dream. <laughs> and on my end, so. I have been a designer publisher for pretty much my entire career, which meant I have done literally everything from basic concept, designing the mechanics, laying out the text, making sure that it works well, cleanly, art direction, uh, Kickstarter management, publishing, printing, marketing, you name it. And for this, it was a, oh, I'll set up the contracts. Hey, Jamie, go do the art direction. Yeah. No. Oh, <laughs> exactly. we, we need these layout spreads. Just do it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, can you design these things? Okay, just go. It's almost it's like it, it makes happens. sense to do things as a team rather than on your own. It's weird. Yeah. Um, now, most people don't like to do the uh, thankless work of publishing. And I'm, I, like, I, I'm not going to be doing full-time just publishing with no design work because I am a designer. Uh, but it's a nice change to be able to, like, this is the easiest project for me because I'm not doing everything. I'm only doing, like, half the work. It's delightful. I don't have to, like, play testing. Eh, Jamie will figure it out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and for me, it's like a lot of the stuff that's super intimidating that I was really worried about. I get to see Jason take care of it and Jason like talks through. Um, and, and the fact that like Jason could pick up, like, for example, how important community copies are for me. So uh, he was the one that went ahead and set up the one dollar community copies. Uh, so I really I really feel like Jason is like a, an attentive partner, really pays attention. <laughs> So you mentioned playtest and you you're very active with the gauntlet and i was wondering uh are there games assets which are there for people to <coughs> sorry to play online easily that you you anticipate it uh, is it the the usual and very good character keepers as google drive documents or did you go an extra mile with i don't know or more tools more stuff to play uh, uh once more into the void uh, online Uh, I will say for for me, the character keeper is like super simple because the game is like really simple. You mainly just need the PDF in order to play. But Roll, uh, which is a platform that's revving up, was one of the first to have like something set up for Once More Into the Void. So it's built into it where you can draw a card and you have a space for the tokens. Uh, and Roll as a platform is already in beta. It's super amazing. And so there are lots of people that are are using it to play once more into the void super super well because you can also put in the pdf into your tray and you can access it easily it's super super smooth uh but yeah like it's it's fairly easy to set up play for once more into the void online just as it is like very easy to do it face to face 
Sounds good. And uh, we mentioned booklet. Are there goals also for because you you mentioned people playing the game as superheroes, but uh, you know the the trope of the let's get the band together. You could play a music band. You could play pirates in a somewhat historical settings. Uh, are there reskins also as part of the Kickstarter or future projects? Ooh, yeah. I think personally, we wanted to focus on Once More to the Void. Uh, we didn't want to like blow up uh, to have too many like uh, intense stretch goals in place. I did suggest a few to Jason and Jason uh, grounded me a bit <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, to help me like stay, stay on target. So, but I would, the thing is like, I've already seen people hack it uh, because it's, it's super easy to do so. Oh, did we lose? Jason, but yeah, um, he's still with us, but not yeah. uh, with a camera. Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. There you go. He was yeah, very, yeah. My, very my... still for a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I've seen people hack it. Like, I think there's a reason why there's so many firebrand hacks, though, because it's really, really easy uh, just to like tweak a few things and have a completely new game. Like for a lot of the firebrand hacks you actually have the same mini games. Once More Into the Void is slightly different in that most of the mini games are new. Though I want to stress that like, I, I took a lot of the structures that Megway and Vincent Baker had like put together and I just retooled it. But uh, for a lot of the classic Firebrand games, it's so easy to put them into new, uh, new ideas. So yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people easily hack Once More Into the Void. And if Jason wasn't around, wasn't around to control me, I would probably like. <laughs> have a lot more but thankfully he's he's reining me in <laughs> well, it sounds uh, like a, a game which would be very fitting for I, I need to attend one of the gauntlets uh i think it's called saturday or star wars saturday or uh, star wars sunday Ooh. um yeah, yeah even the premise of, Rich takes care of yeah. once more into the void is very close to a campaign idea i had for the the old star wars d6 so uh, I think it could be very cool to play Ooh. an old Republic captain yeah. coming back uh, to save the day once more or, or not <laughs> because the, the fight is lost. Um, um, there... yeah. I would love I would love to see uh, uh, a la Bad Batch, but um, yeah. Captain Rex. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that would be sick. And like a bunch <laughs> of clones. The clones are my favorite. Yeah. Um, who are like, yeah, no, no. <sighs> Back to the Clone Wars. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that ended poorly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be, oh, that would be really good, though. I'm starting to think about it already, but yeah. So uh, it was not the first time I heard of uh, uh, cooperations across borders to, to go on Kickstarter. Uh, previously, all shorts have been quite su successful, I think. Uh, are, there, are there already lessons that you, you learned that would be useful to other organizations and people would like to, to try to engage with that, uh, not necessarily with Southeast Asia, but even other regions, uh, if, if they want to have this sort of, yeah, cross-border cooperation between someone in, uh, in Canada or the US and someone who is, uh, I don't know, in another place of the world where the access is not the same. Hmm. <laughs> That's a very good question. I ask good now, the questions. Question is how to answer it? Uh. Uh, so, uh, can can I dig into some of the messy business stuff, Jamie? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so the way that we have it set up uh, on a purely pragmatic publishing end is, um, I have the ability to purchase copies of the print book at cost that I can then sell into traditional distribution. This means that as a uh, North American publisher, I can take advantage of, my, of the existing traditional distribution networks. And functionally, I can get uh, money that Jamie wouldn't be able to get anyways. Yeah, exactly. So this way, I'm not depriving jammy of anything but i'm but my business is also going to prosper the other main advantage here is 
it is um, fantastic marketing for my company. And it allows me to uh, maintain a regular re release schedule. Because I normally will take an hour to 18 months in order to actually publish a new game, produce and publish a new game. Um, but in this kind of arrangement, I can actually, um, I can actually uh, release a game far more frequently. Um, I might be able to maintain things in like uh, every six to eight months instead of every 12 to 15. And that's great for my company. So, and it, you know, cash flow, et cetera. Uh, so from a purely messy business angle, that's some of the attraction uh, on my end. I mean, I also specifically chose Once More Into the Void because it is a emotionally gripping game about how people's minds change and how they adapt to difficult situations in their past. And that is my jam. I mean... One of my last games, After the War, is a mimetic science fiction game about communities who are trying to overcome trauma 10 years after the Galactic War with mimetic viruses running around. So I'm like, yeah, no, no, th th this is my brand. Hits you in the feels because the world is a hard place. And let's see if we can grow past that. Yeah, can you imagine? Or just be totally dysfunctional. Yeah. Either way works. I can imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a win-win indeed because well, uh, people would, you would uh, have a collaboration like that with they benefit from your experience and your established brand and the, the trust people already have in the Kickstarters you delivered. And on the other hand, I can imagine that you need you need to keep the plate spinning. So people are like Genesis of Legend. Didn't they release something five years ago? Or, no, you you keep. You stay in the new cycle, remain in contact with all the people who are all the, I don't know, writers, bloggers, reporters who uh, who need to showcase their stuff uh, and so on. So, uh, yeah, I can. And, and at the same time, that means you have a curator job because you don't want your, you named it, your brand to suddenly be like, yeah, they publish yeah. a bunch of stuff. But they, they're not really related with one another. So So people are confused with... What they get when uh, when they get something for from you, uh, Jamie. Does that mean that you already have in mind among your twelve projects? It's it's very early. You are about to launch a Kickstarter, but a game you're like, mm, that sounds like Jason Brand. I could try to push it his way. Or would you design a game with Jason in mind? Like, oh, how cool can I hook him up to something else? Oh my gosh, I'd love to work with Jason again. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in general, the, the people I play with or the people I get to interact with, I do tend to create love letter games for them. So it's quite possible that I'm going to make one for Jason. But I, I was really impressed when Jason first talked about Once More Into the Void on Twitter and he completely got what I was going for. Like he completely understood the premise and, and what was the core of the game. Uh, so I think... Honestly, if I just wrote more of the games I'd like to play, I think it would align with what Jason <laughs> likes too. So <laughs> it's um, very likely. <laughs> uh, can I just quote like a little bit of the game that really got my attention? Ooh, yeah. So uh, when all the playbooks, they say, what are the kinds of themes that you're dealing with? Um, so, uh, Play the reformed if you want the mystery and prejudice that come with it. And you are ready to play out the story of a long journey of killing your past and healing your justified anger. It's a play this if you want these emotional experiences and if you want these kinds of personal journeys. That is the chef kiss. Uh, that, that was the thing that captured me. Uh, because that's a lot of attention to the human journey and the human story. Uh, that is a much more nuanced take. Uh, not to mention you've got some solid safety tools, which I always love. 
um, like there's a section on cultural realities, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was that was super important to me. Exciting. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, but the first thing is we need to kick this out, knock this out of the park. So if you want right. me to publish more of Jamie's games, make sure that you support this one. You know, I I'm really I mean uh, refraining myself from supporting Kickstarter campaigns for for financial reasons. Uh, but I'm very tempted by this one. So, uh, I will hey, we have soon. one dollar level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, I, I got some $1 job $1 interviews which I'm lining up. Totally available. <laughs> I, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna. You know what? Uh, it's gonna be my next question. I'm gonna try to abide to principles which are, I'm trying to put in place. Is that I'm not supporting on Kickstarter some or buying a game that I haven't played first. So uh that's I sensible. Do... I yeah. I can't abide by that because that's my two read pile. And I don't see Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of inventoring in there. Yes. Are there physical printed copies? There's one in the world as far as I know. Okay. <laughs> and it's here. But uh, yeah, are there are there are there programs of playtest, or do you just show up at the gauntlet and uh, request the game as as one can do actually? Oh, yeah, yeah. You you can totally uh, set up a, a request at the gauntlet. There's also we already have an actual play on YouTube. The first time I play tested it on the gauntlet that was recorded, and so you can find that there if you want to see the game in action. But it's super easy to set up a game on the gauntlet because. Um, People have been really supportive <laughs> in the Ghana community, and it's very easy to play once more into the void. So uh, there's one that's going on right now. I think David Morrison just set up a game, so it should be easy. Uh, Gauntlet, Gauntlet this. You can just go to the Slack to game request and then ask for that particular game, and someone should hopefully like snap it up. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm going to do just that. Um, are, there other yeah. are there other things about the game that uh, or the campaign that uh, we have not covered that we would like to, to discuss, the two of you? Yeah, I, I do want to draw attention to the amazing artists that we're working with. Uh, I did see recently there was a discussion on Twitter about how artists aren't uh, as uh, appreciated as they should be. And so I definitely want to give a shout out because I think the artists that, we, that we're working with have done an amazing, amazing job. So Adrian, who you can find on Twitter at Defenestrating. So that's D-E-F-E-N-E-S. T R A T I N. Uh, they've done an amazing job with the cover. They were super easy to work with. I sent them like, like I said, all these Pinterests <laughs> like links, and they pulled it together in a really, really amazing way. And our interior artist uh, is uh, Camille Chua, and she's done an amazing job as well. You can find her on Twitter at Cam is Frillion, so that's C A M underscore I S underscore F R I L L I O N. And like Once More into the Void is is a, is a game that could be anything you want it to be, but with because Jason was the one who suggested to have as many illustrations as possible, right? Like I it didn't even occur to me you could put in that many because uh, he was suggesting like an illustration for every mini game, which to me was like, oh, what is this abundance and luxury? Uh, and so we've gotten two so far from Camille for the, for the mini games, which were really great. Uh, and the, the cover art is what people have seen so far, but I'm telling you like uh, up close, the, the, the cover art is just, absolutely amazing and I think it's it's doing a lot because as a as an indie like for me as someone who like mostly has only existed in pdfs on itch.io there's this constant like there's a there's an understanding right that the way you present the game the layout the art does a lot to sell the game and so there's this like strange cycle of you should of course hire artists for what they're worth and not you know and and give them uh you know the what is just compensation 
uh, which which Jason has done. Jason like went ahead and, and invested in the project. So uh, so that's how we were able to get the art that we have so far. And yeah, I think I just want to highlight how awesome it is to work with artists and how awesome it is that there are that there are platforms like this one where it'll be it'll be easier to to work with them some more in the future. So uh, that's that's something that I wanted to contribute. Like I'm super thankful uh, for Jason's direction and also the ability to work with these amazing artists. Oh, did <laughs> Instead you of pick... just going through pixabay.com. <laughs> oh, did you pick those artists? Oh, because that's 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 quite a it's a big deal, you know, finding I find the the right artist for the tone and the type of game because people the, the selling part is often there, but I'm more and more aware about the, the things which are in between the line of the rules uh, and how do you convey that, that, okay, the vibe of it could be, because it could be once more into the void and it this, uh, you know, the word is being thrown around, picaresque space adventure and it's wacky and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's more the Orville uh meets firefly then it is a dark emotional deep story of things so uh yeah how, how did you find the artist was that a, a big discussion that the two of you had to, together yeah jason actually was the one who suggested we work with people from southeast asia which is really uh awesome i'm really glad jason gave that guidance and so uh, with Adrian, I was really lucky. This is such a weird story. My partner met Adrian before the Panini uh, at a bookstore. They talked about masks, a new generation, and that's how they connected. And so when I was looking for an artist, and I was thinking about it. Matthew was like, you should, you should ask Adrian. And I was like, really? You think so? You think they'd be open to it? So that was like amazing. Camille, um, I sent, I, I just put up this like Twitter post just asking like people to apply. Uh, and I, that I was specifically looking for artists from Southeast Asia and artists of, you know, with a, with a priority for artists with marginalized genders, because that's super important to me as a non-binary person. And so uh, that's how, I got in touch with Camille, so that was like using Twitter as a as a Twitter thing. Uh, but but definitely it was difficult to go through because there were like a lot of great uh, people, a lot of great artists who who applied. And what I really loved about these artists was Adrian has this like really great like heroic feel to their art that really just captured the vibe and. Camille loves to focus on the idea of like recreating myths in the modern world. And I really wanted to like tap into that also. So, and to bring those two, you know, art styles together, Jason made another amazing suggestion. <laughs> so, so you see how important Jason is the whole time, right? Anyway, so Jason made this other suggestion of uh, we should have a color palette, right? To like merge the two. So it doesn't, you know, even if you have different artists, there, there'll be a cohesive, feel to it. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, so I was thinking of color palettes and then Jason is like, you know, we could go with the bisexual pride flag because it's a really nice set of colors. Uh, and I was like, oh, bisexual lighting. Of course, that's amazing. And it's so funny that Jason said that because I looked at the email I sent to Adrian for the cover and it was already following a lot of the bisexual colors. I was like, I think in bisexual flag colors, that's an amazing revelation. So anyway, that that really helped bring everything together, I, I feel so, uh, while still like honoring the different styles between the two artists. And Jason, you are the one who take this art and put them in a layout uh, then. No, no. No, not even this time. This is the lovely thing. I just got to say, hey, Jamie, do it. Here oh, Jamie go. does it, okay. Um, so I did it for the Kickstarter page, um, but Jamie's doing all the actual layout, so it's delightful. Um, yeah, it's also yeah, great for like, me. I know how to do it. I could do it, but <laughs> it's great to have partners. <laughs> yeah, it's it's nice. I mean, uh, right now I'm going through the the layout thing uh, with Francita Soto and. I'm always so scared that I come across, I might be coming across this way as a really, really annoying because I'm in this, 
uh, Uncanny Valley of... Uh, I know... I know... I, I recognize good graphic design. can be very demanding, but I cannot do it myself. I cannot deliver it uh, as a architect trained in different stuff and i've been working with a lot of print material as part of, of my work but uh that that means sometimes i'm like ah, am i am i coming across as nitpicky or or did i uh, yeah the, the, it's difficult because even stuff like uh in my situation uh francita did drafts and and Seeing the draft made me realize a number of things which became instructions, but it's frustrating that it's normal, I guess, but at the same time, I was frustrated that I was afraid she would be frustrated that I was suddenly coming up with this laundry list of specifications, but I had to see the draft before that. So yeah, having you two work together on that, Jason, who I assume is, is, well, is aware with layout and, and you, Jamie, it's your thing, you're on top of things. But at the same time, it's nice to have someone to, to give a bit of feedback to consolidate things. Uh, it's definitely the, the best arrangement I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, there's some little practical things like the itch version was great for digital. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, because it was white text on a black background, it wouldn't work that well in print. Um, there's been a lot of complaints concerning um, a few books out there. Um, yeah, I have for that specific them. reason. So <laughs> some from London. Like, oh, okay. So let's change that around so that we can so that it works a little bit better in a print context. So, Things like that that are easy enough to do. So the one with the CGI characters, just for people watching this and wondering because I I put the slideshow, uh, which are black and CGI ladies on the, the right hand are the itch version. So the new one's gonna be entirely yeah. different from this. Yeah, it's yeah. bright and colorful and uh, very bisexual with the with the colors and uh, and gradients. So yeah, I actually started incorporating incorporating more gradients into the layout because I saw Jason was using gradients a lot with the Kickstarter images, and I was like, you know, that's really nice. I should. <laughs> so there's really like this constant like feedback loop. <laughs> Excellent, great. Well, we are most at uh, the one hour mark. Uh, one last sales pitch uh, to do for people to rush to your Kickstarter page. All right. Uh, so Once More to the Void is coming to Kickstarter May 11th, uh, 2021. You can head over to kickstarter.games uh, to check it out. Uh, if you're curious, you can back the campaign for the $1 community uh, copy level and download the itch version of the game immediately. Take a look if it's your thing uh, and you have the means uh, to upgrade to a print copy or a standard PDF, we would encourage you to do so. If money's tight, feel free to stick with it. If it isn't your kind of thing, feel free to um, cancel pledge and keep the, P the itch version of the game uh, with our compliments. We want to make sure that the game um, is available to as many people as possible because quite frankly, we're excited about it and want to hear people's stories. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I want to stress that uh, with the Kickstarter, even though the game is basically finished, it'll mean I'll get to work with an editor. It'll mean I'll get to work with a, a, a developmental consultant. It'll mean that I get to like add a few things, right? And, and really bring the game to its final form which is the uh because itch.io is really great for games and development and games that you're still working on but i'm really excited to bring once more to the void into into something you can put on your shelf uh thanks to jason's help <laughs> amazing where can people find the two of you uh you can find me at genesis of legend on twitter or uh genesis of legend.com for my website or .ca either one works um jamie yeah and you can find me on twitter too at temporal hiccup and you can find me on itch.io at temporal hiccup and you can also find me on patreon that's where um, my patrons have access to the 12 projects i'm working on so uh if you want to see more behind the scenes stuff as i work on on these games that's at patreon.com slash sword queen games so yeah 
I'd love to see you around. Amazing. And I will include links to all of that in the description of the episode, whether you're watching this on YouTube or uh, in audio format. Um, and alongside you will find a link to my own game on itch. Uh, .io Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring, which is currently in the process from moving from the text on the edition to a nicely laid out with art edition. And But don't be shy purchasing the current edition, because if you do, uh, the cost will be deducted from any future purchase of the improved version. Thank you so much, Demi and Jason, for joining me. And please, people, go rush on Kickstarter to support once more into the void. Cheers, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>